To introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Tim Davis, I'd like to introduce Professor Alan Edelman. Welcome, everybody. Before I introduce Mr. Sparse himself, I'd like to welcome you all to MIT. I've taught in this lecture hall many, many times. Uh, this is one of the largest lecture halls on campus. And it's a funny thing. The students don't always come to, to class. When I, if I were to think of this as a matrix it, if, with my students, it's usually a sparse matrix. But, but I'm looking today, and I would say that this is a dense matrix. So, so let me welcome you all to MIT, and uh, let me introduce Tim. So, so, uh, uh, so, so Tim Davis is, is, is Mr. Sparse, or in my mind anyway, and um, he's, he's responsible for, for sweet sparse, and he's certainly very sweet, but his accomplishments are, are certainly not sparse. <laughs> so so uh, Tim's a professor at Texas A&M, and he's a graduate of, uh, of Urbana-Champaign in Illinois in 89, uh, which was the same year I graduated. And uh, one of the first things that I did when I graduated was uh, fly off to France to, to a city in the southwest called Toulouse uh, um, at, at a center called Surfax. And one of the first folks that I met there was Tim himself. And I always have a, a, a lot of respect for people who come from uh, non-English speaking countries and come and live here in the United States because I went off to, to France and listening to, to French, which I barely knew, you know, going very, very fast was very, very tiring. And it was really a great pleasure to, to, to listen to an American accent. <laughs> Uh, as often as I could, and, and uh, Tim was just very, very kind to me throughout my, my stay over there. We had a lot of good times back then. So, so uh, Tim, Tim's got a lot of honors. He's a fellow of, of SIAM, of IEEE, of uh, ACM, uh, and uh, he's now at, I think I said this, but he's now at Texas A&M University, and he'll be our first plenary spec uh, speaker today. So here you go, Tim. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alan, for that kind introduction. Yeah, we, we do go way back. It's uh, before Julie existed, we, we were there. It's uh, at Southfax. The first French phrase I learned was, Je travaille au, le, au Centre Européen de Recherche et de Formation en Recherche en Calcul Scientifique. That was my first French phrase. You can't. It means a European Center for Research and Training in Advanced Computational Science or something like that. So yeah, I would make all kinds of crazy faux pas. I just dived in. Uh, uh, I'll say this joke first in French, and then the French can laugh, and then I'll translate. <laughs> J'étais dans un parc et, et j'ai voulu dire, j'ai voulu à dire, j'ai un cerf volant avec du fil, mais il manque du vent. Mais j'ai dit, j'ai un cerf volant avec du Fille, mais il manque du vin. So what I wanted to say, and that was totally by mistake, and three of you clapped. So what I, what I wanted to say was I have a kite with two strings, but I need the wind, but what I actually said is I have a slow brain with two girls, but I need the wine. <laughs> really, totally by mistake. So that was our time in France. Uh, and in France, actually, I did the start of what is now backslash in Julia. This was in, in the Eocene era. Uh, <laughs> what year was that? Uh, 1990. Uh, I started work on UMFPAC, which is the sparse LU factorization in Sweet Sparse, which is also part of backslash in Julia and MATLAB and Octave and R and Mathematica. And it all started there in Surfax. Today, though, I'm going to talk about graph blahs. Uh, this is a, 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 a package for doing graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra. So I'm going to talk to you about that, but it's also a package that can provide fast matrix operators for Julia, for MATLAB, R, Octave, and so forth. And I'll also talk to you about some of the updates in my Sweet Sparse Meta Package, which is a collection of sparse matrix package. So this is all my work here. The Julia work, though, is by Ray Kimmerer, uh, Viral Shaw, uh, and others. And uh, so, first of all, 
graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra. It's been observed for, for a long time, and what GraphBlas is trying to do now is make this happen computationally in a software package to support a kind of, if you will, a, if, if I can say, MATLAB for graphs. In other words, a, a Julia for, a, a, al a package that allows high levels of abstraction to write graph algorithms. And to, to do this, we can do something called, use something called a semi-ring. And GraphPlus does something beyond a semi-ring, I'll explain. But what is a semi-ring? A semi-ring is a way of redefining matrix multiply. Matrix multiply, in the conventional case, is the plus times semi-ring. So to do the dot product, you pairwise multiply the, the terms AIK times BKJ using the times operator, multiply. And then you sum those up into a number. That's conventional matrix multiply. The monoid here is called the plus. That's the summation. And that monoid has an identity value of 0, which is to say x plus 0 is equal to x. Now, in the sparse case, things change just a little bit. We don't need to do the summation over the entire vector. Instead, we just sum do the, apply the multiplicative operator, the times operator, on the entries that appear in those two vectors. In other words, we're computing a set intersection in the dot product. Uh, and, and so if AIJ, if calligraphic AIJ here is the non-zero pattern, the non-zero pattern, but that's going to change, uh, of the ith row, and if BJ is the non-zero pattern of the jth column of B, then this is done across the intersection here. So that's the conventional plus times summering. Although I need to add that, that this is actually not the, always the fastest way to do sparse matrix multiply, but this is the way to think about it. Now, this is not the only way to define matrix multiplication. For example, there's a thing called the min plus uh, summering for tro called tropical algebra, because it was invented, I think, in Brazil. Um, and the, uh, here the monoid is the min operator, and instead of, and the, the multiplicative operator is plus. So in that dot product, instead of multiplying pairs of numbers together in the intersection, uh, we sum them, and then reducing that, those numbers down to a scalar is done using the min operator. And so the definition of matrix multiply for the term CIJ uh, looks like this. And now the identity value of the monoid is plus infinity. The thing not there is now plus infinity. And in the sparse matrix, the chairs here that are empty would be filled with the number plus infinity conceptually. Although in graph plus, that value is just not there because a matrix can, can move from semi-ring to semi-ring. So that's actually breaking the notion of a semi-ring uh, a little bit or extending it. But uh, the value not there depends upon the semi-ring it's used in. And so we don't actually need, though, because when we're computing over the set intersection, we're computing on the structure of these matrices, we don't actually need the monoid value computationally. It's just a, it's just a convenience. Uh, mathematically, sometimes I use it, but we just have to reduce these values across the intersection. And if there's no intersection, then Cij is not the identity value, it's just not there in the matrix. It's an empty chair. So a true summary ring has lots of properties. It has the plus operator, which is a monoid, which is a, a, an associative operator with an identity value. It's also commutative and associative both. And so it has all these nice uh, properties, and whoops, and we keep all of this in graph laws. The star, the multiplicative operator, is an associative operator with an identity value of one, and it has all these nice properties, and it distributes as well, in particular, and this means that A, the matrix multiply of A times B times C can be done in different orders. Well, we, we break that. So graph laws does have true semi-rings, but we also have different kinds of summer rings or an extension. And I'll show you why we do this, because it's useful for creating graph algorithms. But I needed to first introduce the idea of the summer ring to redefine matrix multiply. And what we do in graph laws is we X this bottom part out, and the, the multiplicative operator is just any binary operator. So it's a pseudo summer ring or a semi pseudo ring, or you know, pick your name. Uh, it's, whoops, it's a, I'll call it the graph plus summary. 
or just a summer ring, and just bear with me mathematically. And also, the, uh, the domain, there can now be three different domains. The domain for the matrix A can be different than the domain for the matrix B. In other words, the value, the data type, can be different from C itself. And that's very useful uh, in many graph algorithms. And speaking of that, graph laws allows for arbitrary data types. It has different sizes of integers, different sizes of floating point operations. And if you want new ones, you just make them up, give them to me, and I'll just do it. So one of the collaborations I'm working with is a, is a company called Permian.ai, and they need a Gaussian integer, which is an integer with complex and, and real and complex parts. Uh, you just define it and give it in. You don't have to recompile my package. It just does it. I'll explain how I do that later. So why are summer rings useful? Why are sparse matrices useful for graph algorithms? Well, I mean, if you're inside Julia, you don't write a triply nested loop. If you're inside MATLAB, you don't write a triply nested loop to do matrix multiply, right? You want to live in a higher level of abstraction. You just want to do A star B and then let somebody else handle that. The same can be true for graph algorithms. Graph algorithms often have this pattern, this double or triply nested loop. For every node, do this. For every edge, do this. And if something is true, do this. That pattern of computation, if you sort of take your glasses off and squint, uh, looks just like a matrix multiply. But well, just pull out that operator and put a different one in. And then you get a summary. ring. So here's an example of. One example uh, is the all pair shortest path. If you have a weight matrix the, where AIJ is the, the weight of the edge IJ, uh, and you use the min plus summer ring, and you raise the W matrix to the n minus first power, then you get the all pair shortest path problem solved. If you use the, the tropical min plus summer ring. And here, the thing not there is, the, the, is plus infinity. So if you have this empty chair, if you will, that corresponds to an edge that does not exist in the graph. Now that's an edge not existing in a graph is very different than the existence of an edge of any weight at all. Right? An edge even that's plus infinity, that's an edge. Or an edge of weight zero, that's an edge. Not an edge is different. So in the sparse case, in graph laws, we look at the matrix as, as really two things at the same time. We consider both its structure and the values of the entries in that structure. And those are both important in a graph algorithm and uh, in the matrix data structures as well. So here's an example of uh, the use of a logical or Boolean summer ring. Here in the Boolean summer ring, we don't use plus times, it's or and. So do a logical and, and then this, the monoid summing them up is the logical or, which of course has nice short circuit properties, which I exploit. You can stop early if you come across you know, short circuit or, for example. So here is a, a working pseudocode in sort of pseudo MATLAB which, of the breadth first search. And here the matrix is AIJ is the edge from I to J. And here is the source node. And suppose we're at frontier one and three. And what this algorithm is doing is computing every level in one outer loop for each level. So here we're at level two, next level. We want to discover the next level. And so the first thing that happens is a, the Q is the, a sparse vector. And it represents, in this case, a sparse row. And it represents the non-zero pattern, not represents the nodes in the current frontier. In this case, it'd be entries one and three would be present in the vector Q at when I'm at level Q wanting to compute level, or level two wanting to compute level three. But if I want to save the, uh, if I want to save the, the level of these nodes, I can do that with this assignment statement here, which is a masked assignment, or in MATLAB or Julia, it's logical indexing, or V of Q, where Q is non-zero, assign the current level to that position in V, which is going to give the level of every node. And now if there's no end nodes, break. And then finally, the Boolean summer ring. So what happens here is if you think of the flow of the matrix, multi matrix vector multiply, which I think I also have on the second next slide here with this picture, um, 
So, but let me stay here for the moment. So what, what's happening here is if you think of the nodes one and three in the current frontier, we want to compute the next frontier, level two. So we're going to take nodes one and three and form the set union, not the set intersection, of their outgoing adjacency lists, which is two, four, and six. Oh, four? I don't want four. I've seen four before. So drop it out. And in breadth for a search, there'd be an if statement at the very center of that innermost loop. What we can do in a matrix notation is hoist that up to a level called a mask at a matrix level using the mask, and that's shown right here, where a node that does not have a level gets the assign, assignment. So the mask works as follows. Imagine you're doing, you have a matrix, and you do an assignment into it. It's a bulk if statement. You put your hand over the, ma over the matrix, that's the mask, and you can write to this position, but not to this one. In other words, you can write or not to this one, sorry, because the mask is in the way. So the mask tells you where you can write to the output or not. And that's a matrix level way of expressing the, 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 mask, uh, the, the if test inside the innermost loop. So in other words, node four already has a level, so it does not get in 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 included in the output, the output of this matrix vector multiply here will just be nodes two and six. So here's the, on the left, and we can do more with different summary. So that's the Boolean summary, but there's more with a really strange summary called the any second I, I'll explain. So the traditional breadth for search is on the left in pseudocode. And it's got that doubly nested loop for every node in the frontier, for every edge, if it's not seen, add it to the queue, and so forth and so forth. You've, you've seen this, and you see there's an if there. This traditional breadth for search has several problems with it. It's, well, it's simple, but it's not parallel. If you have to write it in parallel, it's very hard to write. Uh, you need access to, or you need to write your own graph data structure, or have access to one that's gonna help you. And if you have a library that helps you with the data structure, but if you wanna write this kind of algorithm, that, that, that library is gonna be serving you up one edge at a time. Oh, you want the, uh, here is the next edge, here's the next edge. It's really hard to make that fast, it's possible, but it's, it's, it's a very fine grain level of description of this algorithm. It's rather like writing A star B in MATLAB with triply nested loops. You wouldn't do that, because nobody here uses MATLAB, right? No, you wouldn't do that because everybody here uses Julia. So it's akin to A star B in Julia. <laughs> okay, you wouldn't do that in any language, the high level language. So what about the graph plus bed for search? I'm gonna use a rather funky pseudo semi-ring. And the mathematicians will cringe when I describe the monoid, I hope. Um, and so here, here's what this looks like. It looked just like the last one, but I wanna do more. I wanna compute the bread for search tree. In other words, I have, I want a, there to be a tree where four is the root, its children are one and three, and the children of one is two, and the, so a child of one is two, and the children or child of three is either two or six, but two has two parents. That would not make it a tree. I have to pick one of them. Node two has two candidate parents, and in the tree, just pick one, any one. All right, so now think of the dot product. Okay, and I also need to compute who, who found it as well. So I'm gonna let the semmering do both of those things in a single matrix vector multiply. We're gonna ask who found you, and then if multiple nodes can be your parent, I'm gonna pick one, and I'm gonna do all of that in A star Q. So what, what does that? Well, first of all, the multiplicative operator. Imagine the dot product. What I want to do in that dot product is I want to know, I don't, I'm multiplying these matrix times vector, but I don't want to know the value. The matrix is just structural anyway. There might have weights in it, but I just want to ignore those weights. I just want to know, I just want to work on the structure. Does this edge exist or not? And the outcome of this, 
the output of this dot product needs to be the value one or three for, for node two here. The dot product here would say, oh, one and three. Oh, look, I could, I could be either coming from one or three. And so I want AIK times QJKJ. If you go back, if I go back here, I want the value of this expression here to be the value k itself. In other words, I want to redefine aik times bkj to be equal to k, which is not the value from the matrix or the vector. It's the position of those entries in that matrix or vector. So that's what I call the second i operator. It's, I call it second i because it's the, the, I, the i, the row index of the second operand. So you could imagine first i would be i itself for this expression. Second, uh, and second j would be one, because or zero if you're zero-based indexing. It'd be the column index of the second operand would be the second j operator. Well, so I'll make it second i. And so now for node two, I'll get the numbers one and three. Now I want to collapse these numbers one and three to a single number, and that will be the parent of node two. Well, I can't use a plus monad. I would get four, and four is my grandparent. That doesn't make any sense to add node IDs. I could use the min monoid and get the number one reliably. I could use the max monoid and get three, or meh, Tim, just go pick yourself and just give me one of them. So this is an operator of choice, of my choice. Random, and it's not random, it's not a random operator. And the, it's, I call it the any operator. It's any of x and y is x or y. I pick, and if you don't like it, don't use the operator. <laughs> okay, and um, this is really handy. Uh, it has a rather strange monoid uh, characteristics. It, I argue that it is uh, associative and commutative, the any operator. It's, it's pick one, any one. You have the same choice, right? If I say, Pick, what, here's, here's A, B, and C. If I say pick one here, and then of that pick the result, well, you'll get one of three. So if you do that in any order, you'll get, you're just telling me pick one of the three. So it's associative and commutative. The monoid value, the identity value is rather peculiar. It's really any value, because I, it's my choice. X plus anything is not anything, it's X. <laughs> so any value is the identity value. That's what's weird about it. But then I don't actually need the monoid to compute with anyway, because I only compute on the set intersection. Why do I, why do I introduce such a bizarre, why don't I just, Tim, use the min, and you get a definitive answer. Well, it's faster, because this is a parallel package. And I've got multiple threads computing this. And I could have multiple, one thread comes up with one, one thread comes up with three, and then they just do an atomic write. And it's either a one or it's a three. And whoever got there first loses. The one last, that's the answer. You run it again, you let the race condition, it's a benign race condition that improves then performance. You don't like it, use min. Okay, uh, and, but if you like performance, use any operator. And uh, now there's a strange summer ring for you, isn't it? It's sort of like the N of NP completeness, right? I get to pick, you don't, ha <laughs> ha. I'm the oracle who picks. The other advantage of this is the graph data structure is opaque. You can just tell me, oh, do the matrix multiply, and this matrix is a complex beast. I have multiple ways. I have 16 ways of storing your matrix for you, and I pick, depending on the characteristics of the matrix, for each data type. In fact, it's not just 16 because there's different sizes of integers and in complex and double and real. No, it's 16 different data formats for each of those. Then finally, there's, a, there's two mass assignments here. There's the first one I explained. If you don't have a parent, then you can go into the subsequent frontier. But I also need to keep track of the parent of all these nodes, which is this mass assignment as well. So there's this, this mass assignment happens all over the place in graph laws, and so I spent a lot of time getting that to work uh, efficiently, and it's rather like logical indexing, and it takes out that if in the innermost loop. So this is the BFS tree in graph blahs. Pseudocode, it's two lines of, uh, uh, two lines of graph blahs, and it works pretty, pretty
pretty well, and you don't have to write your own graph data structure. You let me handle all the heavy lifting. And it's parallel without even looking at it, because the library is parallel. You're giving me a bulky thing to do, a matrix vector multiply. I've got a multiple core machine. I'll eventually be using GPUs, uh, and then I can do these things in parallel. Uh, here's another example. This is now using pure MATLAB syntax, because uh, that's what I do. I do MATLAB, sorry. Uh, here on the left is my implementation of a, uh, a sparse deep neural network in pure MATLAB. And it's using uh, the conventional matrix multiply Y times the weight. So it's propagating through these layers. And then it has to do this funky thing to do the biasing. You have to take a column of the matrix, any non-zero in the column, say, adds, we want to add 32, I think is the number I'm doing here. Uh, oh, the bias, sorry. Add some bias value, bias of k, to the kth column. So I'm adding a value to every entry that's already non-zero. So you don't want to add a value to the thing that's not there, the zero. So that's not a matrix add. It, it's what is it? It's, well, it's actually a diagonal matrix multiply. It's scaling by a diagonal matrix. You're just in the wrong semi-ring if you use the conventional one. This is the, so the scaling effect, the adding the bias, is here, it's the plus plus semi-ring. So take your weight, take your y value, and take your bias as a diagonal matrix, multiply on the right, you're multiplying by the bias, if you will, every column, but the multiplicative operator is plus, because you actually want to add the number there. And so it's a plus plus semi-ring. This here is the conventional plus times semi-ring. And then the rest of it here is thresholding. If anything's negative, set it to zero. And if anything's bigger than 32, set it to 32. I can do this syntax as well. I have fully overloaded operations here. I could run this in using graph blas matrices as well, but or I can make it a little bit faster using the functional form. And uh, so complexity-wise, they're this roughly the same in terms of, of, of conceptual difficulty of writing these two pieces of code, but one is 40 times faster than the other. And I'll let you, get, you can see on the screen which is which. So uh, the built-in sparse matrix operations uh, are not as, not as fast in MATLAB, although, um, and I'll explain more about that later. And here, using graph laws with 20, a 20 th core machine, 20 threads, I've got a 40x speed up. So it's not just parallels that I'm getting speed up over, over MATLAB. It's more than that. What can graph plots do? What tools are, are in the toolkit to give you these operations? Well, if you think of Julia's syntax, the, the star, the tick, the equal, the paren, the colon, the comma, the whatever, okay? All the, all the non-alphabetic characters the left and right square brackets and such. All of that graph plots can do, sparse with any data type you like, even ones you make up, even semi-rings you make up. And, 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 uh, and then each of these can be masked. The M op thing here is the, the masked operator. So here's a masked matrix multiply. And the, each of these operations also has an accumulator. So this is like C plus equals A times B, where the plus is this accumulated Accumulator operator. Uh, so uh, what else? Entries have any data type. Uh, we can use any operator. So for example, with what I call zombies and pending updates. So a zombie is really useful, and not just in the movies. Uh, imagine if I wanted to make sure that everyone is seated in no, no empty seats, just everyone's packed together. And that would be a sparse data structure. All the rows are all packed together and you want to kick someone out of the room and maintain that data circle. Everybody has to get up and move over one chair. That's expensive. So what I do is the person I want to evict from the room, I just make a zombify them. So you are now a zombie. Okay, so it's a pending deletion, basically. So I have a, mat a sparse matrix with pending deletions in them. And then, and the same thing I can do with pending additions. If, if new people come in the room here and there's no space for them or it takes a, oh, they just wait in a pile over here. They wait in a line and they don't have to be added to the, to the data structure all at once. 
or at one at a time, that's too slow. I can wait and add them later, so that's pending updates. So I have all of that in graph plus. And so thus you can iterate over a matrix and just stick an entry in, stick an entry in, oh, thank you very much, and I just pile these up until you want to do something interesting in the matrix, and I say, oh, hang on, I've got to sum them up, I've got to sort them and stick them in the data structure. The, the mask, as I mentioned, is super important, and it's basically this. This mask assignment here, C of, whoops, C of M equals A, is simply this loop for all entries. It's mathematically, obviously, I don't, this is sparse. I don't actually compute it this way, but this is what the mask assignment does. I just do it efficiently. Here's an example in Julia. Yay, and there was much rejoicing. Finally, Julia, oh, he's not talking about MATLAB anymore. All right, so this is by Ray, who was mentioned earlier. He's one of the conference organizers, and I've had the pleasure to work with him for several years now on the Julia wrapper for graph laws. So this is this funky thing, mole, shouting. Stop shout, quiet. Why, why you, sh you guys shout here? Mole. This is doing R plus equals A times W using the plus second semmering. So the second operator, is f of x, y is just y. Why would you use that? Why not? Well, what this is doing, you could instead say, I mean, page rank doesn't look at the values and the edges. It just says the existence of the edge. So in MATLAB and Julia, you could say spones of a. Well, I don't have to do that. I can just do a. And wherever I see an entry in A, I say, oh, you're actually equal to one, ha ha. It's one times X times Y then is just Y, is like one times Y. The advantages of that, first, you don't have to construct a new matrix, and second, the, the, the second operator tells me internally, I don't even need to load the values of the A matrix, and I just cut the, the memory traffic in half, and thus I doubled the performance of the algorithm. So this would be expensive because you don't know that it's all equal to one and you're loading all those ones in and that's ridiculous. So plus second is a faster semi-ring as a result. So we have, graph laws itself is, does, has no graph algorithms at all. It doesn't even have a breadth first search, which is like the first graph algorithm. It has just these matrix operators. So we have a package on top of that called LA graph which is a version 1.0 release, and we have six polished, stable algorithms, many experimental algorithms. And here's a list, I won't go through all of them, except I will say something else, something very interesting about this list. These methods here, KCore, counting graphlets, so there's 16 graphs of size four, and this algorithm says every node, every node say, how many times are you in these 16 graphlets? and you get an n by 16 result. Triangle polling, uh, Fiedler vector, maximal matching, uh, basically the, the marriage problem. You have this node wants to marry that node, and, this, and then just marry them all, but you can't have tri-marriages, and then you, that's matching, edge matching. Uh, uh, maximal matching, coarsening, all those are really interesting algorithms. Do them in parallel as well, please. So imagine you just told an honors undergrad student to do those algorithms in parallel. Good luck. Even here at MIT, they'd have a hard time. Well, I, my undergrads do that. Those are all algorithms created in the course of an honors thesis by senior undergrads. Why? Because they have graph laws. They're doing it all in LA graph using graph laws. It's feasible for a sharp undergrad to create these graph algorithms, really interesting, difficult graph algorithms with decent performance. Uh, Jeremy Kepner likes to think of graph laws as raising not the ceiling, but raising the floor on the performance of graph algorithms, letting everybody write pretty good graph algorithms with a pretty good level of computational uh, uh, performance. Okay, I also have something really cool I added recently called the JIT. Uh, it's a JIT, just-in-time compiler, right? Well, this is a C library. C doesn't have a JIT. Well, it does now. GraphBlaws allows for arbitrary user-defined types. And this is how you, how you do them. 
types, operators, monoids, semirings, semirings, and they're created at runtime, and you give them to me, the operator, as a function pointer. So it looks like this, a function pointer. So you define in C a function, and you say you declare an op, and you call a function, and you pass to me the function pointer. And then if you want to do a semirring with it later on, uh, every time I need to multiply or add, I'll call your function. And gosh, that's going to be slow, and it is. It's parallel. I can do this in parallel, but it's going to be slow. It's function pointer. So it's very flexible, but it's slow. Well, no more. So that's there in green is slow. So what I do instead is you can give me not just the function pointer, but give me the whole string with the C function in it. And now, if you ask me to do something like matrix vector multiply, using that operator, I'll say, hang on a minute. I got to go talk to my compiler. I write out a C. This is a C library. I write out a C file. I stick it in your home directory, because I'll bring it again. I'll write it there. I'll go compile it. I'll load it in, and then I'll call it. Now, that's slow the first time. Right? Second time, though, it's already loaded. There it is. Now, you shut your computer down. You come back tomorrow. You ask me the same thing. And oh, I did it yesterday. Here it is. I don't have to compile it again. Oh, what was the question? Oh, yes. OK, so there's the JIT. I'll JIT the JIT. So uh, oh, yes, at 940. I was thinking 945. Oh, of course, it's questions, yes. Uh, performance. OK. Uh, any questions so far, actually? Let me stop here. Before I dive deeper, then I'll, I'll kill all the questions. Yes, question. How do I do what? I'm sorry? How do, how do I make a type def more than 64 bits? Oh, OK. So the any operator is not a user defined, user usable operator. So the data type, the operator any will not work on a user defined data type. Uh, so that, would, that answers your question. You'd have to use a different, op you'd have to create your own operator for that. And, and yes, that will be done atomically. So if you have a data type of 256 bytes and you want to make up an any operator yourself, go for it. And it'll be atomic. I'll make it so. Now, it won't have the same exact properties as my any operator. Could you repeat the next question? Yes. That would, did I repeat that question? I thought I did. OK, the next question. Yeah, is there another question? OK, a great question. Yes, Viral. So the JIT, uh, so you know, uh, it seems like there is a graph plus graph for in Julia. Yes. So in Julia, is it likely, is it already possible or likely the case that you can then pass Julia functions? No. Julia functions? Short answer, OK, the question, Vero's question, can you pass a Julia function and let me uh, JITify that? The answer, short answer is no. The long answer is no. Uh, what I can do, though, is really is almost useful for Julia. OK, see, you can now pass both to graph plots. You can give me the function pointer and the string with the C code in it that is the function. Great. And sometimes I'll use the function pointer when it's not performance critical. I'll need it a few times. And when it's performance critical, I'll build a matrix multiply, say, with this string. OK, what if you just want to give me the string? Like, you're in Julia. You don't want to have a C function pointer that's compiled. That's ridiculous. But you maybe could construct a string of C code. So fine, just don't give me the function pointer if you don't have it. Just give me null, and I won't call it. But I need it, so fine, I jit it. I'll compile the little string in its own little library. Hey, string, nice library, and I'll call that. So you don't even need to give me the function pointer anymore. So I did that just for Julia and Python and MATLAB. And if R wants to use it, OK. So 
is it is is graph plus fast? I'll, okay, short answer, yes. It's if you compare it with the basic operations in MATLAB, it's three to typically three to seventeen times faster. Um, it's a million, literally a million times faster than than in logical indexing in MATLAB. I mean, literally seconds versus days or weeks. I literally I let my computer run for a week and it finally finished this expression, and I ran that expression in graph plus and it takes seven seconds. It's exactly the same performance in A star B because it is graph plus inside. A star B, A sparse times sparse in, in MATLAB is a graph plus. It's built in. Um, MKL sparse, it's anywhere from two to 20 times faster than a parallel sparse library from Intel. And it's 20,000 times faster than Network X, which is a Python library for doing graph algorithms, which is not meant to be super fast, but it's super expressive. It's got 400 algorithms. But it's 20 times faster than SciPy, which is a high performance uh, Python package for, for scientific computing in PageRank. Uh, what about versus C++? I mean, surely I can't be a really hardcore parallel C++ code written by an expert in writing graph algorithms in C++, can I? Actually, I can, which is crazy. In other words, it's a, this is a tool that you can let an undergrad write a parallel library in, conceptually, and I've done it, and yet, and you can write that code in MATLAB or Julia or Python, and you actually beat a highly tuned C++ algorithm written by an expert in graph algorithms, Scott Beamer. That's in green. Or you don't, that's in red. <laughs> Okay, so I don't always win. I can be two or three times, six times slower in this case for this large matrix. But think of, look at the algorithms. And I've got one minute left. Um, this is Python and MATLAB, the full code. And I just glaze your eyes over it. Basically, it's a two pass breadth first search, and it's doing computing, counting paths, and summing them up, and dividing by such, and you get centrality uh, metric, and it's readable code. Well, this is the expert's code. This is, this is code that only an expert can read and write. It's got OpenMP Atomics and Compare and Swap and all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and yet it's faster than that. Graph plus beats this in that one, in that, for that one uh, graph at least. So the impact of graph plus, uh, it's a faster alternative. A sweet sparse graph plus wrapper is faster um, than the sparse arrays. It's uh, built into MATLAB. It's in graph libraries like Redis Graph. It's, it's saving lives in Israel right now, for instance. 80% of all prescriptions filled in Israel are analyzed for hazardous drug interactions. I'm working closely with a company called Permian.ai. They have a graph signal processing a graph neural network mechanism. The engine inside is GraphBlas, and they're now selling this product as a prolog wrapper for GraphBlas. And they have, in particular, uh, the bank, a large, a very large bank they're working with, and uh, a three-letter agency, which I can't, they don't even tell me which three-letter agency it is. Minus 10 seconds. Okay. So um, there's the community, lots of people involved, and I'll skip over uh, sweet sparse, lots of cool stuff in sweet sparse, but I'll skip over that. So to sum up, graph law is an expressive mathematical language. So if summer rings, you get these bulky computational kernels, lots of work inside with parallelism. It's an opaque data structure, so it's easy for even an undergrad to use. I'll do the hard lifting of the hard data structures. The performance is excellent. You can do your own data types at will. And in the future, I'm working on uh, CUDA kernels and I'm working on more kernel fusion where I can take multiple calls to graph laws and say, mm, I'll wait and do those later together as a single computation and thus get better performance. So any last, maybe one last question. Okay. No, no last questions. All right. Thank you very much. I'm hoping, Tim, you'll be willing to take questions um, yeah. during the breaks. I'll be here also during the whole conference. So, and uh, I used to like MATLAB too. <laughs>